Talking today to Andrew Dent from Fabadashery, a 3D printing design consultancy. Andrew, when did 3D printing start and how does it work? Well, 3D printing um, really has been around for a while, um, 10 to 20 years, but what we've traditionally called it is um, rapid prototyping, and it was limited initially just to the use of, of forming prototypes of, of, of objects. Um, the real revolution we've gone through is um, producing objects which um, represent the final finished form, and we'd often call that digital manufacturing, so going from um, a digital design straight to the finished artefact. And how much does a, a home 3D printer cost and how much is a professional one and what's the differences between those? Again, a big part of the revolution has been this reduction in cost. And um, a, a decent 3D printer now that's suitable for use at home is going to cost you around a thousand pounds. High-end printers, commercial printers are still um, 10 to 20,000 um, pounds. Printers go all the way up to 100, 200,000 pounds. But we're seeing this radical reduction in cost at the moment. And you can pick up a kit for as little as 300 pounds if you don't mind assembling your own machine uh, over a weekend at home. And what's the printer actually doing in order to create the 3D object? Okay, so most 3D printers work by building up an object layer by layer. And um, Essentially, machines that you're going to use at home are, are going to be depositing plastic. You can create objects um, like this goblet here, which is made out of a plastic. Um, how they work is they take a 3D design file and um, slice that into two-dimensional layers. And most of these technologies work by building up a layer upon layer upon layer until you end up with a 3D object. Um, essentially, to deposit the plastic, you have something which resembles, uh, I suppose, a glue gun, an extruder, which is going to move around and trace out the outline of your object. It's then going to move up and um, construct the whole finished three-dimensional object for you. And what's this technology being used for in practical terms? It's being used for a whole host of industries. Obviously, the very high-value uh, nature of it. Um, has seen that it's traditionally used um, in aerospace, medical applications, uh, automotive, Formula One racing applications like this. But really the explosion of the home 3D printing market uh, over the last few years has seen uh, much more creative uses of the technology. So um, individuals such as jewellery designers through to architectural practices and um, traditional craftspeople start to take this technology and do really exciting and new things with it. And you were saying medical implants as well? Yeah, so I think some of the kind of really exciting opportunities in the future are going to come in the application of this technology in the medical industry. Um, in particular, I think people are very interested in how it can be used in developing implants, um, which are very bespoke, very tailored to the patient and thereby improving a better experience and faster healing for a um, for particular condition. And there, the slightly higher cost of this manufacturing technology is negligible compared to the vast benefits. Um, yeah. And you were saying that in developing countries this technology might be used to um, look at, say, implants, for, in, in, insoles for shoes for particular disease Absolutely. I think one of the side benefits of, um, of this kind of enthusiast market at the moment, if you like, for these uh, low, lower cost printers is the fact that now um, we're seeing some really kind of um, robust printers capable of doing some incredible things, such as printing in relatively soft materials um, suitable for, uh, for instance, shoe inserts and in certain um, developing nations understand that there's um, a lack of um, medical technology which we take for granted. Um, so partly this kind of lower cost, this greater accessibility of very bespoke medical devices, I think it's going to have a real impact on improving quality of life for individuals. And also too for, you were saying possibly for amputees, so as Absolutely. children get older they can presumably have something printed that I think that's the real life-changing thing um, for, for individuals who, who, who are living in a, a war-torn country where, um, uh, again, medical technology is maybe not so accessible. Um, the ability to have a very bespoke, very fitted device is, is, is going to be life-changing, especially because that medical device can grow with the young person as, they, as their body changes and develops, um, giving them 
a much better experience of using it. The term you were using earlier was mass customization. What, what do you mean by that? So in, in terms of um, how product designers are now kind of grappling with this technology, I think there's a lot of excitement around this idea of mass customization, which is the ability to uh, move away from just simply mass production where every object is replicated on a massive scale mm. to actually creating very bespoke one-off pieces. Um, for instance, this goblet which I showed earlier, this was produced uh, by a Dutch company, DUS Architects, um, where for an award ceremony they wanted to produce a hundred unique glasses for a champagne toast. Mm. Now using t traditional manufacturing technology, um, that would have been a very expensive proposition. You'd need to consider uh, producing an injection mould which would cost between five to ten thousand pounds in just for tooling mm. costs. So you need to make a vast number of those to justify that expenditure. Here, every object you print, there's no added cost to mm. how different it is. So it can be entirely different for every every user. So there's much less setup cost in that sense. There's very little setup cost and uh, beyond the, the initial outlay mm. of a machine. So actually, um, it's a very cost competitive technology uh, when we're looking to do things like this and um, I think the other interesting thing about mass customization is um, it allows people to have a much more intimate and closer bond with the objects they own mm. and they typically tend to uh, cherish them more and own them for longer and get more life out of that product um, so again it's it's rethinking that interaction between product designer production and manufacturing in the end consumer. You were describing to, to me the service that Shapeways provides, which in a sense sits somewhere between sort of one-off um, art objects and, and mass production. Absolutely. I think a really exciting company at the moment is Shapeways.com, which um, offer access to much higher end um, printing and print technology um, to form objects from a range of materials. Uh, including precious metals all the way through to glass as well as plastics. And um, how that service works is, as a, as a product designer, uh, for instance, I might have a great idea for uh, a new neck band to hold my iPod shuffle or something mm. similar, and I make that as a one-off just for myself or maybe as a friend, as a gift. Mm. And I produce it and find it's, it's massively popular. Um, now, because my file is hosted on shapeways.com, it's really easy to turn that into a, a, a product by, by then offering it for sale. Shapeways handles the logistics and the production. They mm. produce one or, or many as, as, as demand depends. Mm. I've got no risk and no cost for myself. So it's like on-demand printing, really? Absolutely. And then as a designer, I get a cut of that profit. Mm. Um, and I've taken no risk. And it means people can try much more adventurous and exciting um, design that wouldn't make sense where... If I know I'll only ever sell 100, I could never justify uh, the, the tooling costs to get that injection moulded. So what's going to happen with 3D printing over the next um, five years in terms of practically um, either products or, or development? Five years is a very hard time to predict over because what we see is even month by month at the moment, um, really quite amazing developments in this industry. Mm. I think in five years we're going to see a fairly mature industry. People um, make two very varied predictions and I think the reality would be somewhere mm. in the middle. There's a notion that actually pretty much every household will have this magical uh, box mm. in which we can create and produce any consumer item in the home and that would be wonderful. At the other end people are saying well actually most people probably don't want to be running a factory mm. in, their, in their study. They'd probably prefer a copy shop type model where mm. you go to a corner shop where they have very high-end machines and, and get your objects produced. I think the reality would be somewhere in the middle where we'll see um, a fairly mature technology, which would be in a number of homes, but people will still prefer to use services like Shapeways where it's um, made remotely. I think in terms of really exciting uh, possibilities and the things which are, are developing and happening now is um, there's a lot of people who are putting energy into producing um, electrically conductive materials so that we can print, print and produce circuitry mm. um, inside our objects. So much more functional components which achieve um, things we just 
Hmm. Um, possible using any existing. So the factor. goblet could have a Wi-Fi receiver in it. A a a absolutely. So actually, Wi-Fi and um, mobile aerials um, are actually perfectly suited to, to 3D printing because they can be made relatively large. So you can make more compact devices by integrating that into, say, the plastic shell of your your cell phone. So. I think we're going to see some really kind of. And you were talking topics. about new materials. Somebody had recently invented a, a new material. Describe that. Um, I think it, uh, what we were talking about there is slightly separate from 3D printing, um, but part of a larger maker movement uh, on the whole, which is uh, we were discussing Suguru, which is uh, a material made for, for fixing and upgrading objects. And it's part of. It closely links to this kind of mm. enthusiasm behind 3D printing, which is, I think, people reconnecting with the objects they use. So it's a move away from just mass consumption to wanting to produce things and have an understanding of the history of an object, of where it comes from, how it's mm. been produced. And um, so I think that's kind of closely linked. Andrew, thanks for talking to me today. Thank you very much. Thank you.